Good morning to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to be back here and uh, to worship God with you and to bring God's Word. Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you, of gathering around your Word and your table. And we pray, Lord, that as we gather around your Word, this ancient Word of yours, this enduring Word of yours, that your Holy Spirit will bring your Word like it was just spoken today, just written today, so that, Lord, we may know that this comes from your mouth and your heart, meant for each one of us as we live in this broken world. Bless us, dear Lord, through your truth and through your spirit, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Evangelicals always emphasize and often emphasize the personal implications of salvation in Christ. And I think it's a good emphasis. And uh, it tells us that each one must be saved. You believe that? Each one must be saved. We are not saved in groups. Uh, those born in 1950, okay, saved, and so on. No, we, we, are, we are not saved in clans and so on. We are saved, each one of us is saved. And this is often seen in the way Jesus reached out to individuals in his ministry. If you read the Gospels, you read about Nicodemus, for example, you read about the Samaritan woman, you read about Zacchaeus, and a whole host of others. Even in the crowd, Jesus often reached out to individuals lost in that crowd because he wants to save individuals. And that's very important. He, and the Old Testament, actually, this is nothing new, because the Old Testament tells us in the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, verse 12, it says, you, Israel, will be gathered up one by one. You know, when you're queuing up, the one in charge will say, not all together, but one by one. One by one. And that is God's plan of salvation. That is why we go out to preach the good news to individuals, though we preach to masses, it's the individuals that count because it is individual faith that is created by the Holy Spirit that results in an individual's relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that saves us from our sins and brings us salvation. But having said that, because we live in a very individualistic world, we must not misunderstand that God's interest in individuals leads to an individualistic kind of Christian faith. Just me and my God. That surely is not biblical. And therefore, we, this morning, want to look at God's interest in families. Because I think you all are celebrating family life. And you are going through a series of sermons, if I'm not wrong family life. So God is interested in families too. When Adam and Eve, I believe it was last Sunday's sermon, was it? You, you looked at Adam and Eve. So, yeah, you see your sermons all go all around the world. So I also know about it. Adam and Eve, yes, how God brought together a male and female, husband and wife, into a marriage and blessed them. Abraham was called not only as an individual, but as a family. So he moved as a family to the promised land. And eventually Abraham, uh, his family became the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And the purpose of God was that through this nation, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And this is God's important mission that we need to keep in mind in order to understand this short passage that was read for us just a while ago. 
the context of this passage must be seen in the light of a bigger picture. And the bigger picture is God's interest in individuals, in nations, in families. That's a big picture. And that leads to God's mission. So when you come down, zoom into uh, the book of Acts, you also see a bigger picture. In the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord Jesus told his disciples to wait and to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses, he said, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, the Lord Jesus was spelling out his mission plan. This is his mission. You will be my witnesses in concentric circles, starting from Jerusalem here to the ends of the earth. And if you read the book of Acts, you see that God is actually working out this plan. It becomes very clear to us. And he assures us every time a boundary is crossed, where from uh, Jerusalem to Judea, to Judea, from Judea to Samaria, from Samaria to the ends of the earth. Every time there was a movement that was being pushed forward by the, this, the, the, the Spirit of God and the momentum created by Him, there was an assurance. And what was the assurance? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Some people misunderstand all of that. You, you can't just pluck it and create some kind of a doctrine, but you need to understand God's purposes. God was assuring His people that uh, all this crossing of boundaries was according to His plans and purposes. So you find that as you read uh, the uh, missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul, in his second missionary journey, we read what is called the Macedonian call. That's uh, quite surprising because Paul was just interested in the present-day Turkey and he was doing quite well in spite of persecutions. And then God, the Spirit of Jesus, as the text says, redirected or directed Paul and his associates to cross into Europe. So the first time the gospel went into Europe, and it was in that context that you find uh, Paul and Silas in the European city of Philippi. So that's where our story begins. It's in this very context. I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. It's this big picture and then God's mission, and, and this pushing forward of the gospel of Christ in concentric circles, and then here it comes to Europe. And in Philippi, a wonderful ministry is done by Paul and his friends, but unfortunately, opposition, strong, violent opposition takes place. And so we read in chapter 16, Acts, 22 to 24, they were stripped and beaten. Stripped and beaten. And they were thrown into prison in the innermost cell. And their feet were tied up or locked up in stocks. Very uncomfortable position. And the amazing thing is that Paul and Silas uh, had an unusual and amazing midnight worship service. I don't know if you've ever heard, attended midnight worship service. I have in my time quite a few. We call it watch night service. And midnight worship service is always a challenge because especially when you're preaching and you see all these people who are nodding away in agreement, <laughs> right? And not because they are listening to what you're saying, but because it's way past their bedtime. It's not easy to worship at midnight. But here, these beaten up missionaries were so much filled with the joy of the Lord that they were singing and praying. And it was loud enough for the rest of the prisoners to listen to them. The text says in verse 25. Then a violent earthquake takes place, shook the prison, prison doors were thrown open, and everybody's chains came loose. Amazing thing. God can free prisoners. There is no maximum security prison that can withstand the power of God. You believe that? Yeah. And here we have evidence of that. 
And so God freed his servants. The jailer happened to be sleeping. Poor fellow, he was maybe had a long day, he was sleeping. And then when he woke up and found out that the prisoners were free, he panicked and he took his sword to commit suicide. And uh, because he knew that the penalty, according to the Roman government, the penalty, if you are guarding prisoners and they escape, the penalty is death. So he knew his life was doomed. He, he wanted to commit suicide. And then it was then that Paul shouted, uh, he said, don't harm yourself. We are all here. We are all here. Imagine the darkness, the voices come. We are all here. We are all here. We are all here. And I think the jailer, uh, the text says he was trembling, shaking. He was shivering in shock. And uh, he was trembling before the missionaries and asked the important question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas replied wonderfully, that gospel statement, he said, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And then they added one phrase, which is what we want to observe this morning. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household, or you and your family. Why did they say that? That they were addressing not only the jailer, but also referring to the jailer's family. It appears very clear that the gospel message was meant not only for this individual, but also for his family, you and your family, because this is God's purpose. This is God's missionary purpose. As the gospel expanded cross boundaries, God was, was in the ministry of saving, the mission of saving individuals and families. So this was happening. Now, just to underline this truth, this phrase, you and your household, or you and your family, can be found quite in a few places in the book of Acts. Let me just point out a few, just so that we can be persuaded. You remember that in Philippi, there was this lady called Lydia. And Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth. Without her, we bishops cannot have our colors, isn't it? Purple cloth. Because this, this was not cheap, it was expensive, uh, lucrative trade. And so purple cloth, and uh, she, it says that when she heard the gospel, we read in Acts 16, 14 and 15, she opened her heart to Paul's message. She opened her heart to Paul's message, and she and the members of her household were baptized. Do you see the connection? One person opens her heart to the gospel, and then the Spirit of God works not just in her heart, but also in her household. And so she and her household were baptized. Or you remember Peter, and he goes on to meet up with the Roman centurion Cornelius, and if we read that in Acts chapter 11, Cornelius uh, was a man who feared God. He knew God. Twice, Peter told him, you know this, you know this, you know this from the Old Testament that God is like that. You know this about Jesus, you know this. And then uh, Cornelius told him what happened actually. An angel appeared to him. And uh, the angel said this to Cornelius in, in Acts chapter 11, verse 13 and 14. The angel said, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message 
through which, uh, here, underline, through which you and all your household will be saved. So it becomes very obvious to us that as the book of Acts proceeds, God's heart and love, not only for individuals, but also for families, becomes clearer as we proceed with this narrative. You and all your household. Elsewhere in Corinth, if you read Acts chapter 18, verse 8, Acts 18, 8, Paul is in Corinth, and uh, Crispus is the synagogue ruler. He's a leader among the Jews. He was the chief uh, officer, uh, if you like, of the synagogue, the local synagogue. And we are told that his entire household believed in the Lord and were baptized. Imagine that, uh, the ruler of the synagogue. He and his entire household believed in Jesus and he and his household were baptized. In 1 Corinthians 1.16, Paul mentions baptizing the household of Stephanus. So again, here is not just a baptism of one person, but the entire family, the baptism of the household of Stephanus. Now, this was not just seen in the ministry of the missionaries, but also in the ministry of Christ, our Lord. Because you remember the royal official's son who came to the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he uh, came to Capernaum from Cana, and uh, he told about his son. He says, my son is dying. And the Lord Jesus promises him, assures him, your son shall live. Your son shall live. You know, that's very wonderful news. You go run to the hospital. If you, if you happen to have a child who's not in, in dangerously ill list, and you, you're just wondering what's going to happen, and then the chief doctor comes and he says, your son shall live. Oh, you, you feel so glad. You feel so relieved. And that's how this man uh, felt because of the way Jesus said it, I think. He knew that Jesus said this with authority, not just an empty promise, but Jesus said it with that knowledge and the authority and the power. He said, your son shall live. And then we are told that at that moment that Jesus said it, the exact time the son was suddenly healed. Later he found out, he went home, he found out, yeah, his son is okay, he's living, he's breathing, he's fine. And then what happened? And then he put two and two together and he said, the moment Jesus said, your son shall live, my son was healed. At that same moment, and so the result of it is in John uh, chapter 4, verse 53, we read this, John 4, 53. He, this official's official, he and all his household believed. So obviously here was a blessing. The actions of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the miracle of Christ touched not only this man, but his entire household. And so they all believed in Jesus Christ. So it's, from here we see a number of things. We see, first of all, the heart of God. The heart of God is not only for individuals, but also for families. He loves us and he loves our families. We used to have these four spiritual laws. You remember that? The yellow booklet. I've used it so many times long ago. And if you remember, the first spiritual law is what? If you have used it. This is the first spiritual law. Can somebody recite it? Just to test you whether you have ever used the four spiritual laws before. 
If you have never used, don't worry. It's okay. Just look blank. It's fine. But if you have used it, you will remember that the first spiritual law is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Okay? That, that's how it all begins. And then the whole presentation is uh, designed to win over that individual to Christ. Sin separates you from God, and that gap is filled by Christ who died on the cross for us, and we must open our hearts and receive Him into our lives. That's the message. That's a gospel message. But imagine after all these verses that we have looked at, and this particular passage, if you were to go to the jailer, you wouldn't use the four spiritual laws as it is. You wouldn't tell him God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Rather, you will change it to God loves you and your household and has a wonderful plan for you and your household. Agree with me? Yeah, you can edit <laughs> to, in a, because of a deeper understanding, a better understanding of God's heart. God's heart is not only for that individual, but also his entire family and household. So here in this text is revealed to us our Father's heart. We, on this Father's Day, we celebrate fathers, earthly fathers, but no earthly father is perfect. Agreed? No earthly father is perfect. Some of us have really bad fathers or had bad fathers. And every time we remember them, we cringe, right? Abusive father, absent father, and all that. But God is the perfect father. He loves us. And the Lord Jesus Christ came telling about the father. He kept talking about my father. My father sent me. My father told me this. My father showed me this. This is my father's house. And I'm going to my father's house. And I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house. So he kept talking about his father and his, and his house. And then he also, in his preaching, if you examine the gospel texts, he kept saying, your father... Your father, your father, as if to catch us and, and to turn our attention to God, our true father. Your father, your father loves you. Your father has done all this for you, your father. So in this text, we not only see something of our father's heart, the heavenly father's heart, which embraces us and our families, but also we have revealed to us the Father's mind. That's the beautiful thing about reading Scripture. It is an access to God's heart, God's mind, and God's hands, what He's doing in our midst. So what is in God's heart? Love for us and our families. What is God's mind? Salvation for us and our families. That is his mission plan. And what is God's hand doing? He is doing all that he can do to save us and our families. This is really the message of this particular text because it reveals to us God, our heavenly Father, who wants to save us and our families. Now, let's return to the original text here in uh, uh, Acts chapter 16, and I want to just mention a few more things. Verse 32, it says that Paul and Silas spoke to God's, wor uh, God's word to all the others in his house. So the preaching was not only to the jailer, but to his entire family. They were all listening in the, in the night, 
and they were sharing the gospel to the entire group who were paying at close attention to what was being said. And then the jailer practiced hospitality, washed their wounds, and then we are told in verse 33 that he and his family were all then baptized. That is, the jailer family all baptized right there. And then in verse 34, they had a joyful meal because the jailer had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. You notice how strongly this, this truth is pushed into this text. He and his family. He and his family heard the presentation of the gospel. He and his family believed. He and his family were baptized. And he and his whole family believed in God and received the joy of the Lord. They became children of God. So that's wonderful. And a text like this tells us that that is God's heart and God's mind. And that's what God is doing in our midst. We need to recognize this. Now, what are the implications for this? Okay, we can hear a message like this, go and then have nice Father's Day lunch somewhere. And that's it. Is that, is that it? Or is there something more? Implications that God is actually telling us or reminding us. You remember Revelation 3.20? Uh, Revelation 3.20, Jesus standing at the door of the heart and he's knocking. If anyone hears his voice, opens the door, he promises to come in to that person and to have fellowship with him. He will dine with us and we will dine with him. Now, Obviously, we can, a verse like that makes it very individual, right? Because it's, the personal pronoun is singular, he and him. So it is possible for us to say, okay, really salvation is about just me opening my, my heart's door to Jesus, and he'll come in and have fellowship with him. And that, as I said earlier, as we began this sermon, is true. Because God is interested in us as individuals. But we know that it is also addressed to the church. You see, Revelation 3.20 comes in the context of the message of Christ to a particular church, to a group of Christians. And so it, is, it also has collective meaning. And it tells us that those uh, or in our family members also need to hear the gospel, need to believe, need to be baptized, need to be included in the blessings that come from God. We must think, I think, in terms of implication of our own responsibilities in our families and to really use our relationships in the family to honor Christ to present the gospel, to pray for our members of the family, and to long for their salvation. So we need to pray. If possible, pray every day. Pray every day for every member of your family. Bring them to Christ. Bring them to Christ. Like the ruler, the royal official son in Cana, you remember, he said, my son is very ill. And Jesus said, your son shall live. And sure enough, it happened. So we can bring to Jesus the members of our family so that we, not only us, but our family members can also receive the blessings of God. For the church, we also need to learn from this, and talk about ministering to families. Not just individuals, but families. We need to reach out to families who are struggling. Families today are particularly challenged because of the kind of society we live in, which often adopts values that are contrary 
to godliness. So we particularly need help as families, as parents, as fathers, as mothers, as brothers, as sisters. So the church needs to equip, strengthen, challenge, encourage families. So we need to uh, reach out to families as much as possible. One of the things, uh, maybe I, um, I, I think we can still go on for a while. You know, we Methodists, when, when I say we Methodists, it's either something good or something bad, <laughs> right? Um, so I, when I say we Methodists, we tend to uh, adopt things that are effective over time. Yes, at some particular point in our history, we adopted uh, programs and perspectives of ministry that were particularly effective. God used us used those things very well and blessed us. But our problem is that what we adopt, we dare not give up. So we end up like putting on coats, coat after coat after coat, and then after a while we are paralyzed. <laughs> we can't even move or bend our arm because we are so full of coats, <laughs> so full of structures and programs that we can't move. And that could be one of our problems. So let me illustrate that with just one particular example that has to do with family life. 50 years ago, 70 years ago, even maybe 30 years ago, in Singapore, family life was quite quiet, re relatively quiet. You go to work, you finish work, you come back, and you are with your family, you have dinner, and there was, that was a time when there was no TV. Life was much simpler, right? When no TV, no handphones, no computers, what do you do? You have no choice but to face one another. At least talk, engage, do something, clean up, or whatever. So basically, when we come, came back home from work or school, the family was engaged. You, you follow my argument? The family was engaging, whether deeply or superficially, but the family was engaged. But in our present time, in the last couple of decades, with television, with social media, with laptops, with uh, you know, TV in each room, and so on and so forth, the family has become disengaged. You agree? Disengaged. Even when they go to a restaurant to eat, they're all talking to other people outside the table. They're not talking to father or mother. <laughs> they're talking to their friends. And everybody is busy eating, but not interacting. Now, what happens 50 years ago uh, this, uh, an engaged family comes to church and then the church organizes, okay, something for the children, something for the youth, something for the women, etc. Uh, something for the men wasn't so strong, right? Because men pr prefer to bring family to church and then go down to coffee shop and have coffee. That's, that's what men did until somebody said, hey, we better reach out to the men or we will be lost. They will be lost to us. So men's fellowships were started. But do you see how if your family is engaged, then when they come to church and they have all these different groups, it's quite refreshing. Okay, because they are not just stuck with a family. They have more breathing space by getting to know others of their own age or own kind. So, of course, the ministry of the church expanded. It was very effective. When you gather young people together to, on Saturday evenings to sing songs and listen to messages, of course, they, were, uh, they thrived. But then today, a family that's already disengaged comes to church, and the church further disengages them Ah, it does damage to the family. I think I, I've said enough. 
to make my point, isn't it? To say that maybe our structures need to be examined so that our structures and programs do not further disengage the already disengaged families. And we need to find ways in which uh, families can come into church, stay as families in whatever we do, and then uh, have ministries as families. That is why I personally, this is my personal opinion, I personally think that families should worship together in church, not be separated into different groups. You remain disengaged. You have a children's church or a youth group, they proceed, and then once they finish youth uh, services, they leave the church because they cannot identify with the rest of the church. So we need to, there are a lot of hard questions we must answer prayerfully as we look at the state of our society and the struggles of our families and the structures of our church and see how the Spirit of God can guide us so that we can continue to reach out to families and strengthen family life. And in so doing, the church will be stronger. Our church is only as strong as our families. And our families are only as strong as our individual fathers and mothers. So this is our challenge as we think about a text like this and ask the question, what is God actually saying to us? But I must end by a, a, a note of caution, with a note of caution. I want to say that the family is not the ultimate concern of God. Now that's a bit, you know, for, for those who are really champions of family life, this is a bit challenging to say that in God's mind and heart, he, he, yes, he embraces families, but he pushes beyond it. He pushes beyond it to the larger church. If you read the book of Revelation, for example, just to think about it, you will find that in the visions of heaven in the book of Revelation, there is mention of the larger church, there is mention of the people of God, the tribes representing God's people, and the nations, but no mention of families. Agreed? No mention of families. Uh, John did not say, oh, the families were all called together to form into family groups. No. Maybe that's why Jesus said in, in the afterlife, in heaven, there won't be any marriage. No families in that sense. Because the emphasis will shift to a larger reality, the family of God. The family of God. And we know that God is the Father, and that's the greatest reality. All other fathers will pale by comparison to the fatherhood of God. God is our Father, and we will eventually get to our Father's house. Beth Ab in Hebrew means Father's house. It appears many times in Scripture. To go back to your father's house is to return home. And that's God's ultimate plan, that everyone who is saved in whatever nation or family, whatever church or ethnic group, everyone will return to the father's house. And that's the true homecoming that the scriptures talk about, which tells me that if we overemphasize the family, at the expense of the church, for example, we can turn the family into a new idol. And that's something that perhaps we should bear in mind. We should not, you know, yeah, I, this message is for those who tend to ignore family, and that's most of us. But there's another message for those, we can go to the other extreme, talk about family, celebrate family, and do all that, and turn it into a new idol and miss the point 
that God is interested in his own family. And he wants to bring all of us together into his family. And that family is centered in Christ. John chapter 1, verse 12. As many as received him and believed in him, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And so that's the family of God, centered in Christ. And one day we will rejoice, we will gather as one big family, larger than our own earthly families, larger than our church families, but as great as God is great. So we will be there as the family of God. So we must remember that in, uh, and, and make sure that we don't, uh, you know, uh, turn the family into an idol. There is one phrase that I'd like to refer to from the Apostle Paul, and I'm, I'll conclude with that. In the book of Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, Paul, the Apostle, prays to Father God. In chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says this, For this reason, I kneel before the Father, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Can you see this beautiful scene? Paul kneels before this Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So as we think about our families, we must remember that uh, our family life only has meaning because we belong to the family of God. Praise God for that truth. God has chosen us to be his family. And what we are warned about is to get confused. You know the word love? The word love is overused. Um, I, I remember uh, once Methodist Church, many years ago, before I was bishop, they invited me to their service, evening service, because they were going to start an evening service to reach out to those who did not know Christ. So that's a good thing. Okay, praise God for that and attempt to uh, preach the gospel to those who do not know. So they urged their church members to bring friends who did not know Christ. And that first service, I was asked to preach. I don't know whether they thought I was a good evangelist or something. They asked me to preach. And I, I remember one thing. There was a band singing. And because they want to be user-friendly, they sang a popular pop song, I Believe in mus Music. You know that song? I Believe in Music. So as to attract those who had come, uh, so to say that, hey, we are very hip here, we sing this kind of song, I Believe in Music. But if they had not concluded the way they did, it would have been uh, just a pop song. But the last line, I Believe in God. So I said, okay, they redeemed themselves by saying they believe in music and they believe in God. But my problem was, what sort of belief is this all about? <laughs> your belief in music is put on the same platform as your belief in God. You have literally brought down God to the level of something worldly, secular. Or it's the same. The guy who drove a car, a Mazda, with a label, I love my Mazda. For those who own Toyota, you just change it, I love my Toyota. Or nowadays, Mercedes, my Benz, or whatever. I love my Mazda. Then they go to church, I love my Jesus. To me, <laughs> it, it, it's illogical. It's a confusion of the concept of love. You cannot use the word love in terms of your relationship with God 
and your relationship with your car. You can't denigrate God. You can't diminish God, domesticate God by confusing the two. That is why uh, I, I think that St. Augustine was very helpful here because Augustine said, if you're thinking of something like love, you need to understand uh, what he called ordered love. He, he said, if, if I read my Bible correctly, love has many orders. There are many categories of love, many grades of love. Ordered love. It was an idea that was embraced by the reformers, an idea that was embraced by somebody like C.S. Lewis in more recent times. But the whole concept is this. If you don't know how to love God, all your attempts to love your neighbor is useless. Agreed? If your love for your neighbor is not shaped and formed and steadied and founded on the love of God, it's all in vain. And that's why Jesus said, first, how do you summarize the law and the prophets? He said, first, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Second, then you love your neighbor. If you forget to mention the first, we will get confused with the next, all the other things. So, if I want to love my family, it only makes sense if I love God first. Then, because I love God first, I will learn to love my family, my church, my ministry, and so on, in the right way. That's what's called ordered love. If you don't look at it this way, it will become disordered love. Second Timothy chapter 3, Paul describes the last days. He says, the last days, it will all be so disorderly. Love will be distorted. They will love themselves. They will love pleasure. They will love money. Love will be disordered because they have lost the order. And that's why in the book of Revelation, you, re you remember the Lord Jesus in his first letter to the churches, to the church in Ephesus. He, what did he say? You have everything going well for you. Active ministry, your doctrines are fine, your, your ministry is okay, but one thing I have against you. What I have against you is you have lost your first love. You have lost your first love. And if you lose your first love, everything will go into disarray. So the message for us, we must love our families because God loves our families. But if we are to love our families properly, we must first love God and love Him always first in our hearts. If we do that, I think God will surely open the doors of blessings, the windows of blessings to bless our families. May that happen in our lives and in the lives of our families. Let us pray. Father, we open your word and your heart is open to us. You have revealed your Father's love for us. Indeed, you, you love us as individuals and as families, as churches and as nations. Lord, your, in your mind is a plan to save each of us and also our families. And so speak to us that if we have failed in our responsibility in this matter, that, Lord, you will challenge us this morning. And at the same time, O oh Lord, as we think about families, help us to think of the larger family of God, where you are the only and eternal Heavenly Father. And help us, O oh Lord, to make sure that our loyalty to you is first and foremost in our lives. 
that our love for you is first among all other loves in our lives. And so we come to you, Father God. We ask that you, as Scripture promises, you will pour your divine love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.